King Tutankhamun's name is as famous as historical titans like Julius Caesar, Genghis Khan, and Alexander the Great. But thanks to meticulous historical research and advances in DNA analysis, researchers have found that the actual person behind the name isn't as well known as was once commonly believed. But who was the young man we would come to call King Tut? How did he live? How did he die? And what kind of ruler was he? To find out, today we're going to take a look at some weird facts about King Tut. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel and let us know in the comments below what other Egyptian topics you'd like to hear about. Now when he was a young man, he never thought he'd see people stand in line to see the boy king. King Tut, how'd you get so funky? Born around 1341 BCE, Tutankhamun was the son of the powerful pharaoh Akhenaten. After his father died in 1334, two minor kings reigned over Egypt until Tut was old enough to take the throne. That finally happened in 1332, and Tut ruled for roughly the next eight or nine years. Tut's chief accomplishment is considered to be his act of restoring Egypt to the polytheistic world of the god Amun. His father had converted the whole kingdom to Atenism, a monotheistic religion centered on the cult of the god Aten. But it didn't turn out to be a particularly popular move. Tut died in 1323, at only 19 years old. He was buried in a hastily built, though still ornately decorated tomb, which was eventually forgotten. That would have been the end of his story, but in 1922, British researcher Howard Carter rediscovered the tomb. The media coverage of the treasures he found inside would make the obscure young pharaoh one of the most famous rulers in world history. To us, he's King Tut, but the ancient Egyptians never called him that. Before ascending to the throne, he was known as Tutankhaten, which means living image of Aten. After being crowned, he became Tutankhamun. Amun, also known as Amun-Ra, was the chief deity of Egyptian mythology, which means that this name change applied a pretty significant promotion for Tut. But those names were just the tip of the iceberg. Tut was also known by a variety of other monikers that reflected various aspects of the divine role he assumed as pharaoh. Some of these other names included, well, I'm not even going to attempt these names. Imagine trying to order a drink at Starbucks with one of those names. As with European ruling families of the 19th century, incest was common among Egyptian royalty. Keeping noble bloodlines pure was a big priority, and to that end, it is generally believed that Tut's parents were brother and sister. In fact, tests were performed on Tut's mitochondrial DNA by the Institute for Mummies in Iceland, which sounds like something I would be streaming late night on Netflix, but is actually a research group from Italy. Inherited from only the mother, this DNA revealed that Tut's mom was the genetic sister of the pharaoh Akhenaten, who was known to be Tut's father. However, despite the DNA evidence, historians aren't really sure who Tut's mother actually was. Some believe she was the famous Queen Nefertiti, who was one of Akhenaten's wives. But without new evidence, there's just no way to be sure. For now, in the technical language of Egyptian studies, she is only known as the Younger Lady, which is also something that might be in my queue to stream. Being a product of your family hooking up may have protected the royal family's bloodline in a social sense, but in a genetic sense, it was bad news. As a result of the practice, Tut had a number of prominent physical disfigurements. Contrary to the virile boy immortalized in his famous death mask, the real Tut probably had a severe overbite, a curved spine, a severely disfigured foot, extremely slim hips, a skewed face, and on top of all that, epilepsy. He also likely had pronounced breasts and lived most of his short life in extreme pain. Maybe not so good to be king. Tut had a severe clubfoot, which meant he needed help walking. This is backed up by the fact that over 100 different walking sticks and canes were found in his tomb. Along with them were special stools used for shooting with a bow and arrow. No one fully understood why Tut was buried with these implements until a virtual autopsy was performed and the clubfoot was revealed. Tut's reign as pharaoh was short and, historically speaking, relatively uneventful. 
During his time, the kingdom was involved in a few minor military campaigns against their enemy, the Hittites. Tut likely had no role in these battles, but he did probably play at least some role in reviving the worship of Amun and moving the capital of Egypt from Amarna back to Thebes. He also restored many places and temples that were destroyed in previous conflicts. Tut was only nine when he took the throne, so he needed strong advisors to help him make decisions. Luckily, he had them. The first of his powerful deputies was Haramheb, the commander-in-chief of the Egyptian army. The second was Grand Vizier Ai, an old soldier turned counselor who many suspect was the true power behind the throne. The theory is bolstered by the fact that Ai directly succeeded Tut as pharaoh after his death. However, Ai only reigned for four years before he died as well. Ai was succeeded by Haremheb, who subsequently did everything in his power to erase Akhenaten, Tut, and Ai from the historical record. Maybe he was angry about being initially passed over for the promotion. Good management relies on good communication, everybody. It's timeless advice. Tut was married shortly after ascending to the throne. As was the family tradition, his bride was a relative, his own half-sister, Anka Cinnamon. She is believed to have been a few years older than Tut, but in truth, little is known about her. Like Tut, she was a child of Akhenaten and may have even been married to him. Her mother was likely Queen Nefertiti, who, if you recall, also might have been Tut's mom. For those of you keeping score, Tut's wife was definitely his half-sister, possibly his blood sister, and maybe his stepmom. But hey, family stuff, it's complicated. Among the other artifacts, Tut's tomb contained two small coffins which held the mummified remains of two babies, daughters who were likely twins. DNA analysis confirms they were the children of Tutankhamun and Anka Cinnamon. Possibly due to inbreeding, one of the girls was found to have a severe spinal defect and neither appear to have been born alive. Theories as to why Tut died so young are a dime a dozen and include everything from genetic abnormalities and diseases to outright murder. But a 2010 study found that the boy king probably perished from a malarial infection after he broke his leg. Elements of his genetics probably also had something to do with it, as they likely weakened his immune system, making him especially vulnerable to such conditions. Tut's brittle bones have led a number of experts to believe that he had been crushed, possibly in a chariot accident. However, a virtual autopsy conducted in 2014 found that most of the breaks occurred after the king was already in the afterlife. Possibilities include that the bones were broken during the embalming process or even in the stages of excavating his tomb. Researchers also point out that Tut's severe physical deformities made it unlikely he would have been able to get into a chariot. After Tut was gone, I continued the reforms that the boy king had initiated. The country returned to its worship of Amun, and the cult of Aten was discarded. However, no good deed goes unpunished. When I's successor Haremheb took power, he took it all a step further and began to outright purge all references to Aten, Akhenaten, Tut, and I from Egyptian history and architecture. Temples and monuments that referenced Aten or any of the kings in his line were destroyed. The capital was moved from Thebes to Memphis. Tut was forgotten and his burial site was built over. Haremheb's purge might have erased Tut from the memories of the ancients, but it also had an unintended consequence. Because the boy king was almost entirely forgotten by history and considered fairly insignificant, his tomb had been largely overlooked by looters. Other tombs had been discovered by other foreign expeditions, but none were nearly as well preserved as Tut's. This isn't to say the tomb was entirely untouched. The outer seal had been broken, and evidence showed it had been robbed at least twice in ancient times. Nonetheless, the sheer volume of artifacts was so massive it took eight years to empty the tomb and catalog it all. The idea that a person who disturbs an Egyptian tomb will suffer a curse 
didn't start with King Tut's tomb. Similar superstitions about other tombs date back at least to the 19th century. The massive publicity surrounding Howard Carter's 1922 discovery, however, made Tut's curse the most famous, especially when a number of Carter's team members died within a few years of finding the tomb. Skeptics point out that a dozen years after the tomb and sarcophagus were opened, 50 out of 58 of the people present were still alive. Moreover, most of those who died were either older or in high-risk professions. Of course, 100% of those people are dead today, so we can't rule out the possibility the curse just takes a long time. The discovery of Tut's tomb and the implied story of a young boy ascending to become the most powerful ruler of his time had a great allure in pop culture. As early as 1922, the same year the tomb was opened, imaginations already ran wild with Tut fever as the artifacts toured the world. But the strangest manifestation of the fad may be the buffoonish villain King Tut from the 1966 Batman series starring Adam West. Played by actor Victor Buono, this version of Tut was an adult Egyptologist who got hit on the head and became convinced he was the ancient Egyptian ruler. He tried taking over Gotham City, which brought him into conflict with Batman, who foiled the villain with some biffs, bams, and of course, pows. Maybe even a few cup pows. No rundown of important facts about King Tut would be complete without a mention of the novelty song King Tut by legendary funny man Steve Martin. As the touring Treasures of Tutankhamun exhibit captured the world's imagination, Martin released his song as a single and later included it on his album Wild and Crazy Guy. After performing the number on Saturday Night Live, the single, which contains lyrics like Dancing by the Nile, The Ladies Love His Style, sold over a million copies and actually reached number 17 on the Billboard Hot 100 chart. On the song, Martin was backed by members of the Nitty Gritty Band, who were credited as the Toot Uncommons. Get it? Toot Uncommons? Toot Uncommon? Toot Uncommons? Well, that's some good stuff. So what do you think? What new fact did you learn about King Tut? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from our weird history.